Good Saturday, my friends. So nice to see you here. I know that I missed last week, but we are going to continue in the book Holes by Louis Sakar. I am going to be reading from my computer. I'm not going to put the pages on today. Um, the story gets really good from here. I don't know how far in the story we're going to get. However, we will get as far as I possibly can read, okay? Um, let's see how long my voice holds out. So, here we go. We are beginning chapter 39 of Holes by Louis Sakar. Um, if you'll remember last time, um, Stanley and Zero have made it up to the Big Thumb. And they're eating a lot of onions. So let's go. Here we go. Stanley awoke in a meadow. Looking up at the giant rock tower, it was layered and streaked with different shades of red, burnt orange, brown, and tan. It must have been over a hundred feet tall. Stanley lay a while just looking at it. He didn't have the strength to get up. It felt like the insides of his mouth and throat were coated with sand. And no wonder, when he rolled over, he saw the water hole. It was about two and a half feet deep and over three feet wide. At the bottom lay no more than two inches of very brown water. His hands and fingers were sore from digging, especially under his fingernails. He scooped up some dirty water into his mouth and then swished it around, trying to filter it with his teeth. Zero moaned. Stanley started to say something to him, but wor no words came out of his mouth, and he had to try again. How you doing? It hurt to talk. Not good, Zero said quietly. With great effort, he rolled over, raised himself to his knees, and crawled to the water hole. He lowered his head into it and lapped up some water. Then he jerked back, clutched his knees to his chest, rolled to his side. His body shook violently. Stanley thought about going back down the mountain to look for the shovel so he could make the water hole deeper. Maybe that would give them cleaner water. They could use the jars as drinking glasses. But he didn't think he had enough strength to go down, let alone make it back up again and he didn't know where to look. He struggled to his feet. He was in a field of greenish white flowers that seemed to extend all the way around Big Thumb. He took a deep breath and walked the last 50 yards to the giant precipice and touched it. Peg, you're it. Then he walked back to zero in the water hole. On the way, he picked one of the flowers. It actually wasn't one big flower, he discovered, but instead each flower was really a cluster of tiny little flowers that formed a round ball. He brought it to his mouth, but had to spit it out. He could see part of the trail he had made the night before when he carried Zero up the mountain. If he was going to head back down and look for the shovel, he realized he should do it soon while the trail was still fresh, but he didn't want to leave Zero. He was afraid Zero might die while he was gone. Zero was still lying doubled over on his side. I gotta tell you something, he said with a groan. Don't talk, said Stanley. Save your strength. No, listen, Zero insisted. Then he closed his eyes as his face twisted with pain. I'm listening, Stanley whispered. I took your shoes, Zero said. Stanley didn't know what he was talking about. His shoes were on his feet. That's all right, he said. Just rest now. It's all my fault, said Zero. 
It's nobody's fault, said Stanley. I didn't know, Zero said. That's okay, Stanley said. Just rest. Zero closed his eyes, but then again he said, I didn't know about the shoes. What shoes? From the shelter. It took a moment for Stanley to comprehend. Clyde Livingston's shoes? I'm sorry. Stanley stared at him. It was impossible. Zero was delirious. Zero's confession seemed to bring him some relief. The muscles in his face relaxed as he drifted into sleep. Stanley softly sang him the song that has been in his family for generations. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was just a little bit softer, while the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon. If only, if only. Chapter 40. When Stanley found the onion the night before, he didn't question how it had come to be there. He ate it gratefully. But now, as he sat gazing at Big Thumb and the meadow full of flowers, he couldn't help but wonder about it. If there was one wild onion, there could be more. He intertwined his fingers and tried to rub out the pain. Then he bent down and dug up another flower this time pulling up the entire plant, including the root. Onions! Fresh, hot, sweet onions, Sam called as Mary Lou pulled the cart down Main Street. Eight cents a dozen. It was a beautiful spring morning. The sky was painted pale blue and pink, the same color as the lake and the peach trees along its shore. Mrs. Gladys Tennyson was wearing just her nightgown and robe as she came running down the street after Sam. Mrs. Tennyson was normally a very proper woman who never went out in public without dressing up in the finest clothes and hat. So it was quite surprising to the people of Green Lake to see her running past them. Sam, she shouted. Whoa, Mary Lou, said Sam, stopping his mule and cart. Good morning, Miss Tennyson, he said. How's little Becca doing? Gladys Tennyson was all smiles. I think she's going to be all right. The fever broke about an hour ago, thanks to you. Well, I'm sure the good Lord and Doc Hawthorne deserve most of the credit. Good Lord, yes agreed Miss Tennyson, but not Dr. Hawthorne. That quack wanted to put leeches on her stomach. Leeches, my word. He said they would suck out the bad blood. Now you tell me, how would a leech know good blood from bad blood? Well, I wouldn't know, said Sam. It was your onion tonic, said Miss Tennyson. That's what saved her. Other townspeople made their way to the cart. Good morning, Gladys, said Hattie Parker. Don't you look lovely this morning? Several people snickered. Good morning, Hattie, Miss Tennyson replied. Does your husband know you're parading about in your bed clothes? Hattie asked. There were more snickers. My husband knows exactly where I am and how I'm dressed, thank you said Miss Tennyson. We have both been up all night and half the morning with Rebecca. She almost died from some sickness. It seems she ate some bad meat. Hattie's face flushed. Her husband, Jim Parker, was the butcher. It made my husband and me in sick as well, said Miss Tennyson, but it nearly killed Becca, what with her being so young. Sam saved her life. Oh, one meat said Sam. It was the onions. Well, I'm glad Becca's all right, Hattie said contritely. I keep telling Jim, I keep telling Jim he needs to wash his knives, said Mr. Park, who owned the general store. 
Hattie Parker excused herself, then turned and quickly walked away. Tell Becca that when she feels up to it, to come by the store for a piece of candy, said Mr. Pike. Thank you, I'll do that. Before returning home, Mrs. Tennyson bought a dozen onions from Sam. She gave him a dime and told him to keep the change. Ah, don't take chatty, Sam told her. But if you want to buy a few extra onions for Mary Lou, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. All right then, said Miss Tennyson. Give me my change in onions. Sam gave Miss Tennyson an additional three onions and she fed them one at a time to Mary Lou. She laughed as the old donkey ate them out of her hand. Stanley and Zero slept, slept off and on for the next two days, ate onions all they wanted, and splashed dirty water into their mouths. In the late afternoon, Big Thumb gave them shade. Stanley tried to make the hole deeper, but he really needed the shovel. His efforts just seemed to stir up the mud and make the water dirtier. Zero was sleeping. He was very sick and weak, but the sleep and the onions seemed to be doing him some good. Stanley was no longer afraid that he would die soon. Still, he didn't want to go for the shovel while Zero was asleep. He didn't want him to wake up and think he'd been deserted. He waited for Zero to open his eyes. I think I'll go look for the shovel, Stanley said. I'll wait here. Zero said feebly, as if he had any other choice. Stanley headed down the mountain. The sleep and the onions had done him a lot of good as well. He felt strong. It was fairly easy to follow the trail he had made two days earlier. There were a few places where he wasn't sure he was going the right way, but it just took a little bit of searching before he found the trail again. He went quite a ways down the mountain, but still didn't find the shovel. He looked back up toward the top of the mountain. He must have walked pa right past it, he thought. But there was no way he could have carried Zero all the way up from here. Still, he headed downward just in case. He came to a bare spot between two large patches of weeds and sat down to rest. Now, he had definitely gone too far, he decided. He was tired out from all the walking downhill. It would have been impossible to have carried Zero up the hill from here, especially after walking all day with no food or water. The shovel must be buried in some weeds. Before starting back up, he took one last look around in all directions. He saw a large indentation in the weeds a little farther down the mountain. It didn't seem likely that the shovel could be there, but he'd already come this far. There. Lying in some tall weeds, he found the shovel and the sack of jars. He was amazed. He wondered if the shovel and sack might have rolled down the hill, but none of the jars were broken, except the one that had, they had broken earlier. And if they had rolled down the hill, it's doubtful that he would have found the sack and shovel side by side. On his way back up the mountain, Stanley had to sit down and rest several times. It was a long, hard climb. Chapter 41. Zero's condition continued to improve. Stanley slowly peeled an onion. He liked eating them one layer at a time. The water hole was now almost as large as the holes he had dug back at Camp Green Lake. It contained almost two feet of murky water. Stanley had dug it all himself. Zero had offered to help, but Stanley thought it better for Zero to save his strength. It was a lot harder to dig in water than it was in a dry lake. Stanley was surprised that he himself hadn't gotten sick, either from the sploosh, the dirty water, or from living on onions. He used to get sick quite a lot back at home. But both boys were barefoot. They had washed their socks. All their clothes were very dirty, but their socks were definitely the worst. They didn't dip their socks into the hole, afraid to contaminate the water. Instead, they filled the jars and poured the water over their dirty socks. 
I didn't go to the homeless shelter very often, Zero said, just if the weather was really bad. I'd have to find someone to pretend to be my mom. If I'd just gone by myself, they would have asked me a bunch of questions. If they'd found out I didn't have a mom, they would have made me a ward of the state. What's a ward of the state? Zero smiled. I don't know, but I didn't like the sound of it. Stanley remembered Mr. Pendansky telling the warden that Zero was a ward of the state. He wondered if Zero knew he'd become one. I like sleeping outside, said Zero. I used to pretend I was a Cub Scout. I always wanted to be a Cub Scout. I'd see them at the park in their blue uniforms. I was never a Cub Scout, said Stanley. It, I wasn't good at social stuff like that. Kids made fun of me because I was fat. I liked the blue uniform, said Zero. Maybe I wouldn't have liked being a Cub Scout. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. My mother was once a Girl Scout, said Zero. I thought you said you didn't have a mother. Everybody has to have a mother. Well, yeah, I know that. She said she once won a prize for selling the most Girl Scout cookies, said Zero. She was real proud of that. Stanley peeled off another layer of his onion. We always took what we needed, Zero said. When I was little, I didn't even know I was stealing. I don't remember when I found out, but we just took what we needed, never more. So when I saw the shoes on display in the shelter, I just reached in the glass case and took them. Clyde Livingston's shoes? asked Stanley. I didn't know they were his. I just thought they were somebody's old shoes. It was better to take someone's old shoes, I thought, than steal a pair of new ones. I didn't know they were famous. There was a sign, but of course I couldn't read it. Then the next thing I know, everybody's making this big deal about how the shoes are missing. How it, it was kind of funny in a way. The whole place is going crazy. There I was wearing the shoes and everyone's running around saying, what happened to the shoes? The shoes are gone. I just walked out the door. No one noticed me. When I got outside, I ran around the corner and immediately took off the shoes. I put them on top of a parked car. I remember they smelled really bad. Yep, those were them, said Stanley. Did they fit you? Pretty much. Stanley remembered being surprised at Clyde Livingston's small shoe size. Stanley's shoes were bigger. Clyde Livingston had small, quick feet. Stanley's feet were big and slow. I should have just kept them, said Zero. I'd already made it out of the shelter and everything. I ended up getting arrested the next day when I tried to walk out of a shoe store with a new pair of sneakers. If I had just kept those old smelly sneakers, then neither of us would be here right now. Chapter 42 Zero became strong enough to help dig the hole. When he finished, it was over six feet deep. He filled the bottom with rocks to help separate the water from the dirt. He was still the best hole digger around. That's the last hole I will ever dig, he declared, throwing down the shovel. Stanley smiled. He wished it were true, but he knew they had no choice but to eventually return to Camp Green Lake. They couldn't have couldn't live on onions forever. They had been completely round, Big Thumb. It was like a giant sundial. They followed the shade. They were able to see out in all directions. There was no place to go. The mountain was surrounded by desert. Zero stared at Big Thumb. It must have a hole in it, he said, filled with water. You think? Where else could the water be coming from? Zero asked. Water doesn't run uphill. Stanley bit into an onion. 
It didn't burn his eyes or nose. And in fact, he no longer noticed a particularly strong taste. He remembered when he had first carried Zero up the hill, how the air had smelled bitter. It was a smell of thousands of onions growing and rotting and sprouting. Now, he didn't smell a thing. How many onions do you think we've eaten? He asked. Zero shrugged. I don't even know how long we've been here. I'd say about a week, said Stanley. And we probably each eat about 20 onions a day, so that's 280 onions, said Zero. Stanley smiled. I bet we really stink. <laughs> Two nights later, Stanley lay awake staring up at the star-filled star sky. He was too happy to fall asleep. He knew he had no reason to be happy. He had heard or read somewhere that right before a person freezes to death, he suddenly feels nice and warm. He wondered if perhaps he was experiencing something like that. It occurred to him that he couldn't remember the last time he felt happiness. It wasn't just being sent to Camp Green Lake that made his life miserable. Before that, he'd been unhappy at school, where he had no friends and bullies, like Derek Dunn, picked on him. No one liked him, and the truth was, he didn't especially like himself. He liked himself now. He wondered if he was delirious. He looked over at Zero sleeping near him. Zero's face was lit in the starlight, and there was a flower petal in front of his nose that moved back and forth as he breathed. It reminded Stanley of something out of a cartoon. Zero breathed in, and the petal was drawn up, almost touching his nose. Zero breathed out, and the petal moved toward his chin. It stayed on Zero's face for an amazingly long time before fluttering off to the side. Stanley considered placing it back in front of Zero's nose, but it wouldn't be the same. It seemed like Zero had lived at Camp Green Lake forever, but as Stanley thought about it now, he realized that Zero must have gotten there no more than a month or two before him. Zero was actually arrested a day later, but Stanley's trial kept getting delayed because of baseball. He remembered what Zero had said a few days before. If Zero had just kept those shoes, then neither of them would be here right now. As Stanley stared at the glittering night sky, he thought there was no place he would rather be. He was glad Zero put the shoes on the parked car. He was glad they fell from the overpass and hit him in the head. When the shoes first fell from the sky, he remembered thinking that destiny had struck him. Now, he thought so again. It was more than a coincidence. It had to be destiny. Maybe they wouldn't have to return to Camp Green Lake, he thought. Maybe they could make it past the camp, then follow the road, dirt road back to civilization. They could fill the sack with onions and the three jars with water, and he had his canteen as well. They could refill their jars and canteen at the camp. Maybe sneak into the kitchen and get some food. He doubted any counselors were still on guard. Everyone had to think they were dead. Buzzard food. It would mean living the rest of his life as a fugitive. The police would always be after him. At least he could call his parents and tell them he was still alive. But he couldn't go visit them in case the police were watching the apartment. Although if everyone thought he was dead, they wouldn't bother to watch the apartment. He would have to somehow get a new identity. Now I'm really thinking crazy, he thought. He wondered if a crazy person wonders if he's crazy. But even as he thought this, an even crazier idea kept popping into his head. He knew it was too crazy to even consider. Still, if he was going to be a fugitive for the rest of his life, it would help to have some money. Perhaps a treasure chest full of money. You're crazy, he told himself. Besides, just because he found a lipstick container with KB on it, that didn't mean there was a treasure buried there. 
It was crazy. It was all part of his crazy feeling of happiness. Or maybe it was destiny. He reached over and shook Zero's arm. Hey, Zero, he whispered. Huh? Zero muttered. Zero, wake up. What? Zero raised up his head. What is it? You want to dig one more hole? Stanley asked him. Chapter 43. We weren't always homeless, Zero said. I remember Yellow Room. How old were you when... Stanley started to ask, but couldn't find the right words. Moved out. I don't know. I must have been real little, because I don't remember too much. I don't remember moving out. I remember standing in a crib with my mother singing to me. She held my wrists and made my hands clap together. She used to sing that song to me, that one you sang. It was different, though. Zero spoke slowly, as if searching his brain for memories and clues. And then later, I know we lived on the street, but I don't know why we left the house. I'm pretty sure it was a house and not an apartment. I know my room was yellow. It was late afternoon. They were resting in the shadow of the thumb. They had spent the morning picking onions and putting them in the sack. It didn't take long, but long enough so that they had to wait another day before heading down the mountain. They wanted to leave at the first hint of daylight, so they'd have plenty of time to make it to Camp Green Lake before dark. Stanley wanted to be sure he could find the right hole. Then they would hide by it until everyone went to sleep. They would dig for as long as it seemed safe and not a second longer, and then... Treasure or no treasure, they'd head up the dirt road. If it was absolutely safe, they'd try to steal some food and water from the camp kitchen. I'm good at sneaking in and out of places, Zero said. Remember, Stanley had warned, the door to the rec room squeaks. Now he lay on his back, trying to save his strength for the long days ahead. He wondered what happened to Zero's parents. But he didn't ask. Zero didn't like answering questions. It was better just to let him talk when he felt like it. Stanley thought about his own parents. In her last letter, his mom was worried that they might be evicted from their apartment because of the smell of burning sneakers. They could easily become homeless as well. Again, he wondered they, if they'd been told that he ran away from camp. Were they told that he was dead? An image appeared in his head of his parents hugging each other and crying. He tried not to think about it. Instead, he tried to recapture the feelings he'd had the night before. The inexplicable feeling of happiness. The sense of destiny. But those feelings didn't return. He just felt scared. The next morning, they headed down the mountain. They dunked their caps in the water hole before putting them on their heads. Zero held the shovel and Stanley carried the sack, which was crammed with onions and the three jars of water. They left the pieces of the broken jar on the mountain. This is where I found the shovel, Stanley said, pointing out a patch of weeds. Zero turned and looked up toward the top of the mountain. That's a long way. You were light, Stanley said. You'd already thrown up everything that was inside your stomach. He shifted the sack from one shoulder to the other. It was heavy. He stepped on a loose rock, slipped, and then fell hard. The next thing he knew, he was sliding down the steep side of the mountain. He dropped the sack and onions spilled around him. He slid into a patch of weeds and grabbed onto a thorny vine. The vine ripped out of the earth, but slowed him enough that he was able to stop himself. Are you all right? Zero asked from above. Stanley groaned as he pulled a thorn out of the palm of his hand. Yeah, he said. He was all right. He was more worried more about the jars of water. Zero climbed down after him, retrieving the sack along the way. Stanley pulled some thorns out of his pant legs. 
the jars hadn't broken. The onions had protected them like styrofoam packing material. Glad you didn't do that when you were carrying me, Zero said. They'd lost about a third of the onions, but recovered many of them as they continued down the mountain. When they reached the bottom, the sun was just rising above the lake. They walked directly toward it. Soon they stood on the edge of a cliff looking down on the dry lake bed. Stanley wasn't sure, but he thought he could see the remains of the Mary Lou off in the distance. You thirsty? Stanley asked. No, said Zero. How about you? No, Stanley lied. He didn't want to be the first one to take a drink. Although they didn't mention it, it had become kind of a challenge between him and Zero. They climbed down into the frying pan. It was a different spot from where they had climbed up. They eased themselves down from one ledge to another and let themselves slide in other places, being especially careful with the sack. Stanley could no longer see the Mary Lou, but headed in what he thought was the right direction. As the sun rose, so did the familiar haze of heat and dirt. You thirsty? Zero asked. No, said Stanley. Because you have three full jars of water, said Zero. I thought maybe it was getting too heavy for you. If you drink some, it will lighten your load. I'm not thirsty, said Stanley. But if you want a drink, I'll give you some. I'm not thirsty, said Zero. I was just worried about you. Stanley smiled. I'm a camel, he said. They walked for what seemed like a very long time and still never came across the Mary Lou. Stanley was pretty sure they were heading in the right direction. He remembered that when they left the boat, they were headed toward the setting sun. Now they were headed toward the rising sun. He knew the sun didn't rise and set exactly in the east and west, more southeast, southeast and southwest, but he wasn't sure how that made a difference. His throat felt as if it was coated with sandpaper. You sure you're not thirsty, he asked. Not me, said Zero. His voice was dry and raspy. When they finally did take a drink, they agreed to do it at the same time. Zero, who was now carrying the sack, set it down and took out two jars, giving one to Stanley. They decided to save the canteen for last, since it couldn't accidentally break. You know, I'm not thirsty, Stanley said as he unscrewed the lid. I'm just drinking so you will. I'm just drinking so you will, said Zero. They clinked the jars together, and each watching the other, poured the water into their store stubborn mouths. Zero was the first to spot the Mary Lou, maybe a quarter mile away and just a little off to the right. They headed for it. It wasn't even noon, yet when they reached the boat, they sat against the shady side and rested. I don't know what happened to my mother, Zero said. She left and never came back. Stanley peeled an onion. She couldn't always take me with her, Zero said. Sometimes she had to do things by herself. Stanley had the feeling that Zero was explaining things to himself. She'd tell me to wait in a certain place for her. When I was real little, I had to wait in small areas like on a porch step or doorway. Now don't leave here until I get back, she'd say. I never liked it when she left. I had a stuffed animal, a little giraffe, and I'd hug it the whole time she's gone. When I got big, I was allowed to stay in bigger areas, like stay on this block or don't leave the park. But even then, I still held Jaffe. Stanley guessed that Jaffe was the name of Zero's giraffe. And then one day, she didn't come back, Zero said. His voice sounded suddenly hollow. I waited for her at Lady Park. Lady Park, said Stanley. I've been there. You know the playscape? Asked Zero. Yeah, I've played on it. I waited there for more than a month, said Zero. You know that tunnel that you crawl through between the slide and the swinging bridge? That's where I slept. 
They ate four onions apiece and drank about a half jar of water. Stanley stood up and looked around. Everything looked the same in all directions. When I left camp, I was heading straight toward Big Thumb, he said. I saw the boat off to the right, so that means we have to turn a little to the left. Zero was lost in thought. What? Okay, he said. They headed out, so Stanley's, it was Stanley's turn to carry the sack. Some kids had a birthday party, Zero said. I guess it was about two weeks after my mother left. There was a picnic table next to the playscape and balloons were tied to it. Kids looked to be the same age as me. One girl said hi to me and asked me if I wanted to play. I wanted to, but I didn't. I knew I didn't belong at the party, even though it wasn't their playscape. There was this one mother who kept staring at me like I was some kind of monster. Then, a late, then later, a boy asked me if I wanted a piece of cake, but then that same mother told me, go away, and she told all the kids to stay away from me. So I never got the piece of cake. I ran away so fast I forgot Jaffe. Did you ever find him? It? For a moment, Zero didn't answer. Then he said, he wasn't real. Stanley thought about his own parents, how awful it would be for them to never know if he was dead or alive. He realized that was how Zero must have felt, not knowing what happened to his own mother. He wondered why Zero never mentioned his father. Hold on, Zero said, stopping abruptly. We're going the wrong way. No, this is right, said Stanley. You were heading toward Big Thumb when you saw the boat off to your right said Zero. That means we should have turned right when we left the boat. You sure? Zero drew a diagram in the dirt. Stanley still wasn't sure. We need to go this way, Zero said, first drawing a line on the map, then heading in that way himself. Stanley followed. It didn't feel right to him, but Zero seemed sure. Sometime in the middle of the afternoon, a cloud drifted across the sky and blocked out the sun. It was a welcome relief. Once again, Stanley felt that destiny was on his side. Zero stopped and held out his arm to stop Stanley's two. Listen, Zero whispered. Stanley didn't hear anything. They continued walking very quietly, and Stanley began to make out the faint sounds of Camp Green Lake. They were still too far away to see the camp, but he could hear a blend of indistinct voices. As they got closer, he occasionally could hear Mr. Sir's distinctive bark. They walked slowly and quietly, aware that sounds travel in both directions. They approached a cluster of holes. Let's wait here until they go in, said Zero. Stanley nodded. He checked to make sure there was nothing living in it, then climbed down into a hole. Zero climbed into the one next to him. Despite having gone the wrong way for a while, it hadn't taken them nearly as long as Stanley had expected. Now, they just had to wait. The sun cut through the cloud, and Stanley felt its rays beating down on him, but soon more clouds filled the sky, shading Stanley and his hole. He waited until he was certain the last of the campers had finished for the day. Then he waited a little longer. As quietly as possible, he and Zero climbed up out of their holes and crept toward camp. Stanley held the sack in front of him, cradled in his arms instead of over his shoulder to keep the jars from clanking against each other. A wave of terror rushed over him when he saw the compound. The tents the rec room, the warden's cabin under the two oak trees. The fear made him dizzy. He took a breath, summoned his courage, and continued. That's the one, he whispered, pointing out the hole where he'd found the gold tube. It was still about 50 yards away, but Stanley was pretty sure it was the right hole. There was no need to risk going any closer. They climbed down into adjacent holes and waited 
or the camp to fall asleep. So now we're going on to chapter 44. Stanley tried to sleep, not knowing when he'd get the chance again. He heard the showers and later the sounds of dinner. He heard the creaking of the rec room door. His fingers drummed against the side of the hole. He heard his own heartbeat. He took a drink from the canteen. He had given Zero the water jars. They had had a good supply of onions. He wasn't sure how long he remained in the hole. Maybe five hours. He was surprised when he heard Zero whispering for him to wake up. He didn't think he'd fallen asleep. If he had, he thought it must have been just for the last five minutes. Although, when he opened his eyes, he was surprised how dark it was. There was only one light on at camp in the office. The sky was cloudy, so there was very little starlight. Stanley could see a sliver of a moon, which appeared and disappeared among the clouds. He carefully led Zero to the hole, which was hard to find in the darkness. He stumbled over a small pile of dirt. I think this is it, he whispered. You think? Zero asked. It's it, said Stanley, sounding more certain than he really was. He climbed down. Zero handed him the shovel. Stanley stuck the shovel into the dirt at the bottom of the hole and stepped on the back of the blade. He felt it sink beneath his weight. He scooped out some dirt and tossed it off to the side. Then he brought the shovel back down. Zero watched for a while. I'm going to try to fill, refill the jars, he said. Stanley took a deep breath and exhaled. exhaled. Be careful, he said, then continued digging. It was so dark, he couldn't even see the end of his shovel. For all he knew, he could be digging up gold and diamonds instead of dirt. He brought each shovelful close to his face, trying to see if anything was there before dumping it out of the hole. As he made the hole deeper, it became harder to lift the dirt up and out. It was five feet deep before he even started. He decided to use his efforts to make it wider instead. This made more sense, he told himself. If Kate Barlow had buried a treasure chest, she probably wouldn't have been able to dig much deeper. So why should he? Of course, Kate Barlow probably had a gold gang of thieves helping her. You want some breakfast? Stanley jumped at the sound of Zero's voice. He hadn't heard him approach. Zero handed down a box of cereal. Stanley carefully poured some cereal into his mouth. He didn't want to put his dirty hands inside the box. He nearly gagged on the ultra-sweet taste. They were sugar-frosted flakes, and after eating nothing but onions for more than a week, he had trouble adjusting to the flavor. He washed them down with a swig of water. Zero took over the digging. Stanley shifted his fing sifted his fingers through the fresh piles of dirt in case he had missed anything. He wished he had a flashlight. A diamond no bigger than a pebble would be worth, a thousands, worth thousands of dollars, yet there was no way he'd see it. They finished the water that Zero had gotten from the spigot by the showers. Stanley said he'd go fill the jars again, but Zero insisted that he do it instead. No offense, but you make too much noise when you walk. You're too big. Stanley returned to the hole. As the hole grew wider, parts of the surface kept caving in. They were running out of room. To make it much wider, they would first have to move some of the surrounding dirt piles out of the way. He wondered how much time they had before the camp woke up. How's it going? Zero asked when he returned with the water. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. He brought the shovel down the side of his hole, shaving off a slice of the dirt. As he did so, he felt the shovel bounce off something hard. What was that? Zero asked. Stanley didn't know. He moved his shovel up and down the side of the hole. As the dirt chipped and flaked away, the hard object became more pronounced. It was sticking out of the side of the hole, 
about a foot and a half from the broken, from the bottom. He felt with it, felt it with his hands. What is it? Zero asked. He could just feel a corner of it. Most of it was still buried. It had the cool, smooth texture of metal. I think I might have found the treasure chest, he said. His voice was filled more with astonishment than with excitement. Really? asked Zero. I think so. The hole was wide enough for him to hold the shovel lengthwise and dig sideways into the wall. He knew he had to dig very carefully. He didn't want the side of the hole to collapse, along with a huge pile of dirt directly above it. He scraped at the dirt wall until he exposed one entire side of the box-like object. He ran his fingers over it. It felt to be about eight inches tall and almost two feet wide. He had no way of knowing how far into the earth it extended. He tried pulling it out, but it wouldn't budge. He was afraid that the only way to get to it was to start back up at the surface and dig down. They didn't have time for that. I'm going to try and dig a hole underneath it, he said. Then maybe I can pull it down and slip it out. Go for it, said Zero. Stanley jammed the shovel into the bottom edge of his hole and carefully began to dig a tunnel underneath the metal object. He hoped it didn't cave in. Occasionally, he'd stop, stoop down, and try to feel the far end of the box. But even when the tunnel was as long as his arm, he still couldn't feel the other side. Once again, he tried pulling it out, but it was firmly in the ground. If he pulled too hard, he feared he'd cause a cave-in. He knew that when he was ready to pull it out, he would have to do it quickly before the ground above collapsed. As his tunnel grew deeper and wider and more precarious, Stanley was able to feel latches on one end of the box and then a leather handle. It wasn't really a box. I think it might be some kind of metal suitcase he told Zero. Can you pry it loose with the shovel? Zero suggested. I'm afraid the side of the hole will collapse. You might as well give it a try, said Zero. Stanley took a sip of water. Might as well, he said. He forced the tip of the shovel between the dirt and the top of the metal case and tried to wedge it free. He wished he could see what he was doing. He worked the end of the shovel back and forth, up and down, until he felt the suitcase fall free. Then he felt the dirt come piling down on top of it. But it wasn't a huge cave-in. As he knelt down in the hole, he could tell that only a small portion of the earth had collapsed. He dug with his hands until he found the leather handle, and then he pulled the suitcase up and out of the dirt. I got it, he exclaimed. It was heavy. He handed it up to Zero. You did it, Zero said, taking it from him. We did it, said Stanley. He gathered his remaining strength and tried to pull himself up out of the hole. Suddenly, a bright light was shining in his face. Thank you, said the warden. You boys have been a big help. Chapter 45 The beam of the flashlight was directed away from Stanley's eyes and on to Zero, who was sitting on his knees. The suitcase was on his lap. Mr. Pendansky was holding the flashlight. Mr. Sir stood next to him with his gun drawn and pointed in the same direction. Mr. Sir was barefoot and bare-chested, wearing only his pajama bottoms. The warden moved toward Zero. She also was in her bedclothes, wearing an extra-long T-shirt. Unlike Mr. Sir, however, she had on her boots. Mr. Pendansky was the only one fully dressed. Perhaps he had been on guard duty. Off in the distance, Stanley could see two more flashlights bobbing toward them in the darkness. He felt helpless in the hole. 
You boys arrived just in the nick, the warden started to say. She stopped talking and she stopped walking. Then she slowly backed away. A lizard had crawled up on top of the suitcase. Its big red eyes glowed in the beam of the flashlight. Its mouth was open and Stanley could see its white tongue moving in and out between its black teeth. Zero sat as still as a statue. A second lizard crawled up over the side of the suitcase and stopped less than an inch away from Zero's little finger. Stanley was afraid to look and afraid not to. He wondered if he should try to scramble out of the hole before the lizards turned on him, but he didn't want to cause any commotion. The second lizard crawled across Zero's fingers and halfway up his arm. It occurred to Stanley that the lizards were probably on the suitcase when he handed it to Zero. There's another one, gasped Mr. Pinyansky. He shined the flashlight on the box of frosted flakes, which lay on its side beside Stanley's hole. A lizard was crawling out of it. The light also illuminated Stanley's hole. He glanced downward and had to force himself to suppress a scream. He was standing in a lizard nest. He felt the scream explode inside him. He could see six lizards. There were three on the ground, two on his left leg, and one on his right sneaker. He tried to remain very still. Something was crawling up the back of his neck. Three other counselors approached the area. Stanley heard one say, what's going? And then whispered, oh my God. What do we do? asked Mr. Pendansky. We wait, said the warden. It won't be very long. At least we'll have a body to give that woman, said Mr. Pendansky. She's going to ask a lot of questions, said Mr. Sir, and this time she'll have the AG with her. Let her ask her questions, said the woman. Just so long as I have the suitcase, I don't care what happens. Do you know how long her voice trailed off, then started up again? When I was little, I'd watch my pants dig holes every weekend and holiday. When I got bigger, I had to dig too, even on Christmas. Stanny felt tiny claws dig into the side of his face as the lizard pulled itself off his neck and up past his chin. It won't be long now, the warden said. Stanley could hear his heart beat. Each beat told him he was still alive, at least for one more second. And I'm going to stop there. So until next time, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Bye.